is completely unacceptable, and you will be the one to apologize when you see the comments section. Because I'm telling you right now, Alice, I am not happy with this makeup. I've seen better blush jobs on sexual harassment training videos. And believe me, I've had to watch plenty of those. Ah, oh, Christ, here he comes. Everyone behold God's most wretched mistake. Blew our production budget on a f***ing snack train. Bro, how awesome is this? Brr, I hope you drive that stupid thing off the table and die in a fiery crash. Yo, why so hostile? Didn't you take an ayahuasca trip like two episodes ago? How come we never talked about that? Brr, I guess we forgot. Yeah, it was all right. I began to understand that every consciousness in the universe is tethered inextricably together. I realized that the distance between this and that is illusory. All is one, and one is all. And within two days, I went right back to hating everybody. I paid like $900 for that trip, miserable prick. Anyway, today's movie's gonna be a dinger. Against our better judgment, we're taking a crack at old Danny Aykroyd's disastrous foray into directing. That's right, kids. It's 1991's Nothing But Trouble. Yeah, there's no way to even classify this thing. I guess horror comedy? Survival horror? Man, it's in a league of its own. In order to understand nothing but trouble, you first have to understand how the original 1984 Ghostbusters came into existence. You may or may not be aware that Dan Aykroyd was the brainchild for the Ghostbusters script. Well, see, that's only partially... Hey, must you constantly interrupt me? You've got a voice like a sheet metal violin that's being dry humped by Jennifer Tilly. Anyway, Dan Aykroyd was responsible for the original Ghostbusters screenplay, but not the one that actually got shot. Aykroyd's original vision for Ghostbusters was unfathomably bizarre, gravid with paranormal lore, and far more violent than what we ended up with. The original title was actually Ghost Smashers, if you can believe that. And as you might be aware, Aykroyd has cultivated a lifelong obsession with the paranormal as well as UFOs. The Air Force has been very interested in this. They don't deny the existence of these uh, hyperdynamic, uh, uh, super aerodynamic craft. And he's even got his own brand of skull formatted vodka because he's really into those theories about crystal skulls having mystical powers. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, but before we started filming, you were saying how you couldn't believe people were stupid enough to. Beep, 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 beep. Pipe down, asshole. The point is that in order for Ghostbusters to become a halfway workable story, Aykroyd's script had to be reworked by both Ivan Reitman and Harold Ramis, whose brilliance we touched upon in our breakdown of Scrooged. Aykroyd's original script was a confusing, over-budget mess, and it was Reitman and Ramis who helped shape it into a lean, charming, going-into-business story. So fast forward to the early 90s, and thanks to Ghostbusters and other box office bangers, Dan Aykroyd is a bankable name. He's got his next idea for a movie and is based on an actual experience from 1978 when Aykroyd was apparently pulled over for a speeding ticket somewhere in upstate New York. And the officer detained Aykroyd for a trial with the Justice of the Peace in the middle of the night. Aykroyd was hoping to find success in the horror comedy genre, which had proven to be at least somewhat lucrative with such releases as Beetlejuice in 1988. But the important thing to know here is that in the case of Nothing But Trouble, there was no Ivan Reitman or Harry Ramis available to rein in Aykroyd's over-the-top ideas or help Aykroyd shine up some of those finicky screenwriting details. You know, like character development. Much like Ghostbusters, this project wore several different titles as production clanged along, including Git, Road to Ruin, Trick House, and Valkenvania. And in case you haven't heard this from a thousand other YouTubers, Nothing But Trouble hit the box office with all the appeal of a flaming colostomy bag. It made about $8.5 against a budget of 40. Viewers and critics alike panned this movie so hard, they forgot about all the other cinematic bombs being released in 91. Nothing But Trouble even managed to take home a few of those Razzie-style awards that they give out for garbage movies. Now, this movie marks Aykroyd's one and only directorial foray, but this actually wasn't the result of Aykroyd stroking his own ego. Aykroyd didn't want to direct. It was a practical decision, since he knew it would take forever to shop around for an experienced auteur. Jesus Christ, enough context, bro. 
When are we going to talk about Judge Valkenheiser and how strongly you resemble him? We're going to get to that because I know the only reason you wanted to do this movie is so you could roast me. But first, we've got to talk about what makes this movie so bad. And believe it or not, Chevy Chase is arguably the weakest link. Now listen, it's pretty much trivial knowledge at this point that Chevy Chase, the person, has always been a raging asshole. And for you Rick and Morty devotees, understand that we're not just talking about the Dan Harmon feud. This guy has feuded with virtually every f***ing person he has ever worked with, to the point that Bill Murray, a fellow raging asshole in his own right, couldn't restrain himself from punching Chevy right on the crack of his ass-shaped chin. You know, you are worse than a week of yellow shitstorms. That said, we also recognize that Chevy rocked pretty hard on SNL and in those National Lampoon movies, so he's clearly capable of being funny. In any case, his character in Nothing But Trouble, Chris Thorne, is so one-dimensional that at times he runs the risk of serving as the movie's unintended villain. Have fun. <laughs> fun is actually knowing who half your guests are. What is there to say about Chris Thorne? He's a rich, condescending New York financial advisor with a smart mouth and an ego so expansive that it barely fits inside his flashy BMW. Can't believe this. Thanks for the espresso maker. The bag of shit. So you're saying it's the role Chevy Chase was born to play? It's tough to know who deserves the lion's share of blame. On the one hand, the Thorn character is so poorly written that you can't help wondering how Chevy could have managed to breathe any humanity into him. But we've got a confounding factor. Because he views himself as a creative genius, Chevy insisted on ad-libbing a lot of his lines just like Bill Murray in movies like Scrooge. The difference is that Bill Murray is a brilliant asshole, while Chevy Chase is, well, a far less brilliant asshole. Evil can evil and Mr. Clean. Where do you work out? God damn. Clark Griswold's dropping some clunkers. And now we'll detail what passes for the film's plot. Asswipe Thorne has agreed to drive Diane, played by Demi Moore, to Atlantic City for some lawyer thing. Obviously, he's into her, and we're supposed to believe she's into him because they're both professionals. And he's got a beamer. I don't know. So their big motivation is they want to go to Atlantic City? On purpose? Hey, this was the early 90s. I guess folks had humbler ambitions. What do you want? Well, maybe it's like a Larry David thing, where he's a grump, but we get to laugh along as he falls victim to his own self-contrived follies. Yeah. Thorne ain't no Larry David. For starters, he's profoundly unfunny. Secondly, he seems to be unaware of what a piece of shit he is. And then with Larry David, there are always moments where he gets taken down a peg. But Chris Thorne is never truly humbled during the film. From soup to nuts, he's a rich, smarmy asshole. And that's it. Thorne and Diane are joined by Fausto and Reynalda, two Brazilian heirs. These two, who are over-the-top obnoxious, convince Thorne to take a scenic detour from the Jersey Turnpike. You're winning! <laughs> you have a BMW, act like it. Instead of Atlantic City, they end up in a backroad coke ash district that's been mined out and forgotten. And to its credit, the movie almost manages to raise some interesting social commentary before ultimately falling short. This is the Jerseyvania Triangle. Old damn place is a mess of burnt out factories, junkyards, and coal fields. Believe me, I know. My grandfather was in coal commodities in the 30s. <laughs> So Thorne commits a moving violation and then embarks on a high-speed chase through tiny cities made of ashes. Barry, did you just make a Modest Mouse reference? Modest Mouse? Do I look like I sit around all day watching cartoons? I thought I was making a great Gatsby reference. Pretentious! Thorny Thorne and his crew of hangers-on are apprehended by John Candy, who detains Chevy Chase on five counts of bad improv. Adam, what? Oh, oh, yeah, that's nice. Thanks. The lower back, please. Thank you. Yeah, check the prostate. That's nice. We're finally getting to the good part. But, well, now we're approaching Valkenvania. And once you consider the fact that none of this could be accomplished with CGI, it's easy to understand how the film went over budget so rapidly. Apparently, Valkenvania was based loosely on Centralia, Pennsylvania. There is a negativity about this place. And in 
case we haven't made our point about bad ad-libbing, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Cornelius Crane Chase. You must be into folk art. Welcome. So that's where they buried Flipper. But, but, but visually, I mean, folks, just look. There's a funky karma here, man. Is this a joke? You, uh, care to elaborate on that point, Barry? But, uh, no, asswipe, I do not. It's a lousy movie that features some stunning sets and matte paintings. And now, Thorne and his posse face a kind of kangaroo court summons at the behest of Justice of the Peace, Alvin Valkenheiser, played by Dan Aykroyd. Oh, I will let you be on your way, and well, when you go, the cat's eyes will spin! Now listen! Dude, are you kidding me? Dan Aykroyd is crushing it. Hula, 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 the bula, bula, bula. Look who's got the front seats of the Mexican hat dance now. Do the spiders line, Barry. Just like a bunch of spiders in a birthday cake. Do it. Are you high, you little brain-dead shitterbug? Oh, come on, you old bitch. I never ask you for anything. Oh, God damn it. Just like a bunch of spiders in a birthday cake. Yes. Hey, maybe they could cast you as the judge's uglier brother if Dan Aykroyd ever does a sequel. <laughs> Admit it, Barry. Admit that Judge Volk is actually pretty great. Put out that dog rocket! Well, Barry, he's definitely not the worst part of this movie. Anyway, the rest of the film consists of Thorne and his crew being held prisoner to Judge Valkenheiser's batshit trick house. And I do mean batshit. That room. You can think of Judge V as a fever dream version of H.H. Holmes, except that Valkenheiser's murder mansion leans more heavily on goofy, carnivalesque aesthetics. Just another batch of hot pistol, lily wogget, city chickens to run through Grandpa Alvin's trick house. And in case you think fever dream is an uncharitable way to describe this movie, just listen to this podcast clip featuring the late Taylor Negron, who played Fausto. This is a movie that was Amazing. Uh, that Dan Aykroyd came up with. And I think that it's like a fever dream. So insane. It was the first time I ever really it... smelt a crack pipe. So is he being hyperbolic or is he saying Dan Aykroyd was literally hitting the crack pipe during production? Now that's a good question, Fly. For starters, Bad we... Bad break, you salty bitch. Time to get paid. Well, howdy, folks. We here at Bank Robberry know how tricky it can be to make it to the gym when you're low on motivation and you're too butt-stinking poor to pay for a fancy gym membership. That's why today's episode is sponsored by Ab Zapper, the abdominal muscle stimulation device you've probably seen in all the top stores. It probably doesn't hurt that while you're being electrocuted with excruciatingly high voltages, hundreds of tiny subcutaneous needles will be pumping Trenbolone right into your gut rolls. And hey, this isn't like most of the other crap we shill on this channel. Ab Zapper actually works. Just take a gander at Uncle Barry's new washboard. Get your gains while you're playing fan favorite video games like Starfield, or while you're napping, or even while you're weeping bitterly over pictures of your ex. Hey, is it okay if you take that thing with you outside? Nah, f no. All those electric convulsions really stimulate the bowels. You need to be near a toilet at all times. The promo code is Midlife Crisis. All right, bro. So we're cruising around 100 subscribers. Shouldn't we do something special to celebrate? Look, I'm very grateful, but 100 subscribers is nothing to celebrate. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to dryer lint, and it's got 71,000 subscribers. Well, how about this? We could promise them that if we manage to hit 300 subscribers, we'll fire you out of a giant slingshot so that you land in a wading pool full of elephant piss. Well, wow, that sounds awesome, you fucking idiot. Okay, so we light a beehive on fire, and then you have to strip naked and sit on it until- But you're just rattling off humiliating pranks from those jackass movies. I'm not doing it. Well, you are a... Ugh, God damn it. You are a semi-competent musician, Barry. That's the nicest thing you've ever said about me, Fly. Yeah, well, don't let it go to your head because you still look like a more homely version of that sweaty guy from Total Recall. But it's true that you did the background music for our videos. And since you're too much of a pussy to do stunts, why don't we ask one of our musician viewers to send you an unfinished instrumental? 
You could maybe lay down a drum track and feature their music in an upcoming episode. Eh, maybe. I'm pretty versatile, but don't expect me to play blast beats. I'm not f***ing L.S. Tapario over here. Okay, give him a taste there, fatty Arbuckle. Alright, now mix it up. Put your gut into it. That's not quite my tempo, but it'll have to do. Now bring us back to Judge Valkenheiser. Hey, Bob. Now we already mentioned that Chevy Chase sucks in this movie, but also worth mentioning is John Candy's role as Eldona, the mute granddaughter of Judge V. Now don't get it twisted, folks. We're not opposed to the idea that drag could potentially be funny, especially back in 1991, before the word groomer got thrown around with reckless abandon. The problem is, in this particular case, it's just not that funny. Well, she's got your taint on her now. <laughs> okay, that part's pretty funny, but the Eldona gag still grows tiresome. Yeah, it's true. The joke is that John Candy is a big fat guy, and Chevy Chase wouldn't want to bang the female version of him. And that's about as deep as it gets. Well, for once we agree on something, Fly. The Eldona gag is already stale after 30 seconds, yet Dan Aykroyd milks it for most of the film's running time. Meanwhile, John Candy's other role, the Dennis character, actually kind of works, since he's the only real bastion of sanity within the Valkenheiser household. But sadly, Dennis ends up disappearing from the movie, along with Fausto and Reynalda. Yeah, strangely, they're the only characters that the film seems to reward. When I think about what happened in Balkanbania, I would do it again. <laughs> Not me. I was like James Bond. Dude, let's play some more clips of the judge. He rocks. Well, not so fast. The judge is highly entertaining, but isn't there something off about him? I mean, beyond his more overt grotesqueries. Thorne Financial Publishing, Water Street, New York. Banker? No, no, no banker, no. Financial Publishing. Okay, banker. There's a certain detail that pervades the judge's backstory. There you go! Does the Pope wear a hat with Sergeant York's mother an angel, and will a banker grope for money? Are we noticing a certain preoccupation? Well, all I know is in 17, after they shipped me off to fight, some New York financier rolled in here one day and hog-glousered and tub-wankled my grandfather. Which explains why Valkenvania looks like something shot out by a flea market. We were forced to become what you drove through today burnt out coal field. And this whole thread about bankers goes on and on. Look at this. They're all criminals and creeps. Bankers. Yeah, there is a lot of emphasis on bankers. Death for running a stop sign? And for being a banker, that's the double death. I'd be willing to cast aside all findings. Be blind to your banker's blood. Yeah, the part about banking being in Thorne's corrupted blood might cause some concern. Is this like J.K. Rowling's depiction of the so-called goblins in Harry Potter? Because it kind of sounds like old J.V. is asking the J.Q. Know what I mean? Yeah, but Chevy Chase isn't Jewish, and I don't think his character is supposed to be. So you think Valkenheiser just hates bankers in general? It's not some kind of racial dog whistle? Well, it's not like he fought for the Reich. Listen to it. More on how they packed me off to Farmers Mechanics University in Gracefield, Ohio for my engineering degree. And how I fought the Germans in World War I later. Yeah, all right. But it's still a little weird. Yeah, maybe we're finding out why Ivan Reitman and Harry Ramis wanted nothing to do with this movie. Yeah, I told you this was a bad idea. But there are a few attempts to complicate the judge's character. Take, for instance, the advent of these Jersey Shore stereotypes. Miami, baby, here we come. Say goodnight, copper. <laughs> please, please, no. Ah. Don't kill me. The movie offers a measure of sympathy for the judge, who suffers humiliation at the hands of these ass wipes. Okay. <laughs> Hey, I don't want you. I want Judge Wapner. So the judge retaliates by rev. Mr. Bone Stripper! Yes! Quiet, asswipe. I'm trying to tee it up. So instead of merely jailing these degenerate club rats, the judge sentences them to ride his private roller coaster, which is also Valkenvania's main means of executing convicts. No, I am not making this shit up. Ah, damn, 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 damn. 
In case you're wondering, the roller coaster set him back fifteen thousand dollars in nineteen nineties money. But what what is there to say about this movie? It's just, I mean, it defies belief. I'm stunned. Just admit it, Barry. Deep down, you know this movie is a beautiful disaster. It's not a great movie, but there's a part of you that admires it because it defies all expectation. But, uh, no, it's not a good movie. But I will admit that in terms of visuals, I mean, it's stunning in its own right. And you cannot argue that this movie is lacking in terms of creative juices. Well, we should also point out that regardless of his views on bankers, the judge is definitely down with hip-hop. Fat Barry here neglected to mention that Nothing But Trouble features Digital Underground and Harold's Tupac's debut on the big screen. Poor son of a bitch. I'm pretty sure I would have said no to this one. But on the plus side, Humpty's lines are a lot funnier than Chevy Chase's. She is right one ugly, cross-burning, right redneck, peckerwood police bitch, man. All right. Yeah, and let it be known that the judge can shred them keys like a mother <laughs> Fair, yet another element in this movie that doesn't really work at all for me is these overgrown babies, Bobo and Little Devil, one of which is played yet again by Aykroyd. I don't have a whole lot to say about these characters. Even within the Vulcanvania extended universe, they don't really make sense. Are they supposed to be developmentally stunted from living on poison ground? Did Dennis knock up Aldona? What's going on? I'm Bobo. That's Little Devil. Hi, we're not allowed in the house. Yeah, all I know is there are some pretty funny stories about Dan Aykroyd trying to direct the movie while wearing the baby suit. If any of you viewers know where to find footage of that, please hit us up. Again, this is a pretty terrible idea that doesn't really seem to belong, but I can't knock the movie for lack of creativity or the quality of its effects. Hey, Barry, I just realized I've been neglecting to insult you. I don't want to disappoint our viewers. <clears throat> You look like a bolder, fatter version of Fat Bob from Office Space. But you already did an Office Space insult. You said I look like Richard Real. It was a jump to conclusions, Matt. Hey, I can't be expected to keep track of every single dig. Now, for Christ's sake, let's get to the dinner scene. Okay, so one of the defining scenes from this movie is when Judge Valkenheiser invites his detainees to a nice home-cooked Valkenvania dinner. And even our viewers who barely remember this movie are still traumatized by the grotesque cuisine. How about a nice Hawaiian punch? Now, I personally don't see anything wrong with room temperature fruit punch that's been poured through an oil spout. And I've never understood why these New York fat cats turn up their fancy noses at the meal's opening course. Ants on a log, ma'am? Ah. Uh... Mm -hmm. That's good eating, ass wives. But the next course is a little more polarizing. How do you like the dog, folks? They're serving dog. And in case those anemic, senile, penile-looking ballpark Franks weren't disturbing enough, there's a goofy twist. Yeah, this crazy-ass train rig cost production another $25,000. The prop department allegedly loved working with Dan Aykroyd because he said yes to whatever deranged ideas their fevered brains could cook up. Oh, yes. Here it comes, Barry. Go ahead there, folks. Pick yourself up a couple of dogs. <laughs> Even you're laughing, Barry. I am not laughing. Jesus, pill poppin' Christ. I just had a traumatic memory of my grandfather trying to eat a chili dog. Barry, please do the dog's line. Come on, bro, it means so much to me. God damn it, no. Just one time, Barry. This is just humiliating. Well, go ahead there, folks. Fix yourself up a couple of dogs. God, I love you, Barry. Hey, are we gonna have to censor the judge's Dirk Diggler nose? Why? What's wrong with his nose? Bro, what the f***? 
Man, did something rupture inside your tiny brain? You wanted the goddamn dinner scene, so here it is. Now either advance the discussion or shut the hell up. Well, my favorite part is when the judge attempts his aerial bombardment with the train. That's enough. I'm gonna flip out. Get behind me, baby. <laughs> okay, okay. I tolerated the hot dog thing, but I draw the line at surface-to-air gherkins. And I won't have my sister, who was once the queen of the Mardi Gras, sitting at a table with a pickle shooting tray. Ah, uh, you know you love this shit, Barry. Fucking snob. Anyway, the Brazilian pair make their escape, and eventually, Thorne gets cold feet in regard to tying the knot with John Candy. Judge, as far as her needs are concerned, I could never presume to be able to fill them. Oh, you can slip on a pud collar. Now, yeah, pud collar? Is he talking about a cat? Yeah, yes, Barry. Jesus. Well, anyway, Thorne's fear of commitment does not sit well with Judge V. Damn city walking yuppity, well wallet. Ah, you ain't family material anyway. So the judge sentences Thorne in his banker's blood to death by amusement. Unfortunately, Chevy Chase manages to punch in the right button command. <laughs> Thorne makes an escape. Then there's a long, drawn-out scene where he has to help rescue Diane from the greater teen, yet another of Judge V's kooky murder instruments. Oh, boy. You really put the pin in the party hog now, girl. I guess Dan Aykroyd was a big Gallagher fan at the time. Yeah, Thorne and Diane's escape makes about as much sense as the rest of this filmic illustration of Dan Aykroyd's dementia. And after making a successful getaway, they report their tale to an impossibly receptive Raymond Barry. Something bad, the door flew up and we came, got up into that uh, attic. Who insists that Thorne and Diane tag along with the police to bust the judge in person. Yes, that actually happens in the movie. The police insist that the alleged victims go knock on the door of the perp who just tried to murder them. You folks, of course, will have to come with us for identification purposes. Got anything useful to add here, Fly? No, even I can't defend the ending of this movie. But it turns out the police have been in Judge V's pocket all along. Hi, Judge Allen! Evening, troopers! Can't go too far in this part of the world without running across my friends! Even though they must have been completely aware that they just knocked down his gate? I mean, how the f*** does that make sense? Yeah, I get it. It's bad. In any case, this movie has no idea how to resolve its own tensions, so we bear witness to one of cinema's very few instances of deus ex humus. It's the cold fire! The seams are giving way! Yeah, it probably would have been better if Valkanvania's destruction were caused more directly by Thorn and Diane. Like, he lights a cigar and explodes a gas vent or something. As it stands, it just feels kind of random. And it's an impressive feat that for a movie with a 94-minute runtime, nothing but trouble manages to trot out no fewer than three different endings. The first is when they escape Valkenvania, and then the second is when they go back to Valkenvania to confront the judge, but apparently that wasn't enough, so there's yet another ending that's, well, it's just bad. At least we all got out alive, of course. There's nothing left for us here now, so we're all planning to move in with my grandson-in-law. Oh, see you soon, banker! Yeah, suddenly we get Looney Tunes gags. No. Uh, what? <laughs> but, 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 that's a pretty dumb ending, folks. Tone it down. You know you love the roller coaster. I was astonished by the roller coaster, and I like Dan Aykroyd. It's actually a pretty entertaining movie. The aesthetics are remarkable. And I actually love the part where the judge executes those asswipe club rats. But there's just too much shoddy craftsmanship on the story level. I cannot endorse this as a certified banger. I'm sorry. The characters mostly suck and the story is thinner than my hairline. Well, you should at least acknowledge that the studio pressured Aykroyd into compromising his vision of the film. Uh, yes, but that happens with virtually every movie. And from the sound of things, Aykroyd's original vision of the picture, much like that of Ghostbusters, was kind of incomprehensible. Okay, that's enough negativity out of you, Alan Thickman. Now, why not fix yourself up a couple of dogs? I think you've lost your rabbit-assed mind. 
I'll never be able to enjoy another hot dog thanks to Judge Vulcan Goebbels. Well, at least enjoy some room temperature fruit punch, you sour asshole. Listen carefully. You will not. Hey, yo! Quick as saltfish through a 10 year old goose. What? What just popped in there? What? Ass wipes. You're all ass wipes. Look at all the raging little ass wipes. Well, there's something you don't see every day. Well, look at you, you little shit ass. One, two, three, go! Hey, where that shit stinks? Thank you.